I'm super excited to be joined by a return guest for the very first time. Mark Schaefer is back and I couldn't be more excited to have you back. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. Am I the return guest for the first time? Yes. Oh, well, this is a big day. I'm so honored. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that it's you because I mentioned it in the first interview that it seems that you're always one or three steps ahead of everyone else. And then you are writing a book about community and belonging. And I was like, he's done it again, hasn't he? <laughs> like everyone has been talking about community just recently. But I mean, your book obviously started a long, longer time ago. I'm curious, why? Did you write the book now or not just now, but why has it been published now? Well, it really started Petra uh, in, uh, in 2018 when I was writing Marketing Rebellion. And Marketing Rebellion was sort of a wake up call that marketing, um, traditional marketing just doesn't work like it used to anymore. And I had a chapter in that book about belonging and community. And when I finished writing that book, I thought that's the most important chapter in the book. That is really the future. Now, boom, one year later, we are in a <laughs> pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody starts telling me, Mark, your ideas are, are coming true. Um, people are, are rushing into community. 85% of adults said an online community was their their most important social contact during the pandemic. And then on top of that, Petra, as you know, in Australia and here, and I've been talking to people in Europe as well, this idea of mental health, mental wellness really has been percolating as a global health crisis. It's been creeping in on us since the 1960s and the pandemic just made it worse. And it's in the news here every day. And during the pandemic, I saw this headline, which, which just crushed my heart. It said, um, the headline was, The Loneliest Generation. And it talked about Gen Z and, and teenagers and how they're so isolated and lonely and depressed. And they're, and, and they're just missing many of the traditional community environments that we've had in our world because they're spending all their time with their head down in a phone. I mean, that's one of the reasons. It's a very complicated issue. And uh, so then you start thinking about community and it's an obvious way to create a strong emotional connection with your customers. But then when you look at the psychological implications the sociological implications. We need it psychologically. Even there's physical benefits, health benefits of community. And it's just like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest opportunity for marketing that's completely overlooked. You and I go to a lot, got to a lot of different marketing conferences. When was the last time you heard community? as a topic at the conference. It's just, it's, it's, it's not there. It's overlooked. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, which I get into in the book. But I think this is the time, this is the time for this idea. And I'm not being like naive and Pollyannish saying, oh, start a community and you can change the world. <laughs> what I'm saying is marketing is sick. Marketing needs help. We need new ideas. We need fresh approaches. Consider community. And, oh, by the way, it can actually heal people. It's marketing that works. It's marketing that heals. This is an idea we need to be considering. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, we are recording this at the beginning of 2023. And it was only late last year that there was so much news actually about that companies are getting now evaluated based on the size and the engagement of their community, which has never been there before. But I think companies also realize that products and services are replaceable very easily. We've got more competition than ever. The competitive advantage that a company can actually have is the community. Now, what is the definition of a community for you and that you have in the book? 
Great question, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, I have a community, but they really don't. Mm -hmm. They might have an audience, which is mm -hmm. great, which is important. You know, a, a community is is not an, uh, uh, your blog readers. It's not the people who follow you on social media. All those things are important. But for me, <clears throat> community has sort of three ideas behind it. Number one is there is communion, meaning mm -hmm. that's what means community. It's that people are connected. It's not me talking to you. So when people read my blog, there's no communion. The people who read my blog don't know each other. So there's friendships, there's collaboration, there's co-creation uh, going on. Number two is purpose. There's got to be a reason to be there. There's got to be a reason to meet. And that reason, by the way, is not to buy more stuff from your company. <laughs> That's <laughs> not a very more. good reason. <laughs> That's not a very good reason to, to meet. Now, a side product of that, maybe they'll buy more stuff from your company. Probably will. But that you, you, you need to find a purpose, Petra, that it's it's the intersection of what you believe in and what your customers believe in that that creates a meet a, a reason to meet and work together. So I've got a you know a big part about that in the book. And then the third thing I think that really has to be part of a community is that it evolves, that it changes with the time. So, you know, it's not like a mission statement. It's not like a, um, you know, some sort of brand differentiation that you put in advertising. If you don't change and move with the times, then the community can become stale. It can become irrelevant. You know, I have a community dedicated to the future of marketing it's changing every day. <laughs> it's moving and, you know, changing every day because new ideas, new topics, um, you know, emerge and, and are discussed. So those are the three big differences between community and an audience. And I think that's so relevant to discuss it because when people say, oh, I've got 20,000 followers. So <laughs> like, what yeah. does it even mean? It's so superficial. And I think that also leads into what you um, mentioned before, that we are lon more lonely than ever before, even though we've got more access to technology and to people. But the depth of con of belonging and of the conversation, that's missing. Um, so creating this purpose together takes it to another level. And there's also the saying uh, to conferences, usually you come for the content but you come back because of the community and the same is yeah. with gyms and with companies and so forth. Now the question That's is, true, as yeah. you know, as a, a conference, I think it's a little bit easier because you create an experience, but for a business, for a company, A, who is responsible to set up the platform of a community or the opportunity for people to meet for a purpose and who is in charge of continuing the relevance of it? Is it a community? Is it the leader? Is it a bit of both? Really great question because <clears throat> what I hear from a lot of people who are experienced business leaders and experienced marketers is that once they begin to lead a community, their whole, whole world is turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a great quote in the book from uh, a fellow named Mark Masters who actually created a, a community that is now bigger than his business. The community has become his business. And he said, I've had to reimagine what it's like to be a leader. Everything I learned in business school has been upside down, turned upside down. And it's it's sort of unsettling to give up power, to give up control, to let, uh, you know, to encourage other people to, to take the lead. That's not really what we think about. Uh, that's not what we really learned. In a, in a leadership class. So the way a community usually starts, it, it often starts with one person because to have people come into a community, it has to start with trust. And maybe you don't trust what this is about. You don't trust the people, but maybe you trust a person. So often there is a person at the, at the center of it. It could be a community leader. It could be an executive from the business. Now, 
I, I think another thing to think about in this starting point is the culture of the business. If the culture of the business is sell, 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 always be closing, you're not ready. You, you really have to be patient. There's something I, I, I talk about in the book about having an implied social contract. When have we ever had that in marketing? Never. <laughs> you know, you get money and you have a campaign and the campaign goes away when the money's over. And that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. There's no contract in that. But a community, you're building trust with people. They don't want this to go away. It's a place that they that they love. It's a place they go to visit their friends. So there's a commitment there. So there's a big implication for culture and mindset and leadership. Now, once the community gets going, the, the idea is that you, you're not dictating what's happening. You let the community take you to new places. Let me give you an example from my own world. I created a community and I thought, well, the people in my community, they're going to be interested in the things I'm interested in. So we'll have a little chat room for podcasting. We'll have a little chat room for personal branding. We'll have a little chat room for, for writing. And those are the emptiest rooms in the community. <laughs> because the community said, no, we want to talk about artificial intelligence and chat GPT. And we want to talk about the future of social media and TikTok and the ethics and the regulations. And we want to talk about the metaverse. And we're going to lead experiments in the metaverse. Go for it. So it, it's taking me exciting new places. My community has become my university. This mm -hmm. is where I'm learning. This is where I'm being challenged to think in new ways. That could never happen if I'm the one that set the agenda. I started it because people believed in me. I am in charge of monitoring the culture to make sure it's safe mm -hmm. and happy and nurturing, no toxicity. It's a it's a it's a place for for that that you know people should feel comfortable and safe. And so it, you know, that's the strategy. Keep mm. the place safe. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's very transferable to the workplace also. I think we all have to redefine and rethink leadership because it's not just yeah. one person knows it all yeah. because we don't know anything. <laughs> but it's, I think, what you I mentioned. I think that's is a really good point. I've been reading the same things, Petra, that the, the you know, what, you know, Mark, my friend Mark said how things are so much different around leadership in a community. I think you're making a good point that really expectations, even in the workplace, are moving more toward a community point of view. I think so too, because I think <laughs> the role of a leader is all about curating knowledge from different talents because everyone's got their own uh, view of things and their own experience. And um, with ChatGPT, all of a sudden, not being a thing and now available to everyone, it's changing the landscape so quickly. So the person who has got the most experience or most expertise doesn't say much anymore because things are changing. So when I can tap into an 18 year old who has been playing around with it, why not take advice from somebody of official, more junior when they know more about the topic. And I think you're such yeah. a great role model of curating conversations and sparking an idea or a purpose, as you said, but then letting it go and see where it takes us. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, I think you're, I love your wisdom on this too, around you know, curating knowledge and being humble to ask people younger than you. <clears throat> I'm actually working on a blog post right now. Um, don't know what the title of it will be, uh, but it's something like, um, you're not an expert and you don't have to be. Mm -hmm. Because I think nobody understands anything anymore. I mean, there is not a single person that really understands the economy or the internet or the healthcare system, they're just, you can't be an expert. Mm. Now, I think to be a great leader, you don't have to have all the answers. You have to have the right questions. You have to experiment and you need to you know, move into different areas, try different things so that you know that you've experienced this. You, 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 you know the potential you know the opportunity of NFTs or the 
metaverse. You don't have to be an expert. You'll never be an expert. Mm. But you do to lead. You need to know enough to ask the right questions. And that's why I, I think I know, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're known for your workplace culture and changes in the workplace. I think this is a big one. I think this idea of leadership, how leadership is changing, being humble is so important mm-hmm. to be a leader today. Leadership used to be a macho thing. Yeah. And I say that as a man or a woman, it was a macho yeah. thing Absolutely. that, you know, you want you wanted to be the smartest person in the room. You wanted to be the most powerful person in the room. I think today it's not having all the answers. It's about being humble and being willing to take you know, wisdom wherever you can find it. <clears throat> mm. And I think it requires a big identity shift also because all of a sudden you have to let go of control, which you used to have with the power status that comes with it. But um, you know, when I left uni and I mean, it's a couple of years ago, <laughs> like it was 2006 that I graduated and it was all about billboards and radio and TV. And I did that for the next 10 years in my marketing career. I don't know anyone who's doing that anymore on that scale anyway. Yeah, and yeah. marketers have to be a lot more sophisticated, which means open-minded, curious, and just asking more questions. And I don't think that most leadership programs have actually jumped onto that. And leadership in terms of you running your own community, your own business, or a department or your team, it, it's all the same in the end. I think you bring up a really interesting point. How do you teach this stuff? <clears throat> um, mm. You know, the universities are way behind. I think you're right. And I teach at a university. I lecture at uni- other universities and they're struggling mm. to keep up. And and I think one small piece of the identity crisis for universities today is the next group of customers coming in is Gen Z. Mm-hmm. Gen Z has an entirely different view of the world. And I know each generation is a little different. Each generation, new generation challenges the older generation, but Gen Z like punches above its weight <laughs> in terms of its influence on culture, on music, on fashion, on uh, just you know, norms, memes, expectations, what they're expecting out of work, what they're expecting in terms of the environment, what they're expecting in terms of um, you know, health. I, I read this article, Petra, written um, by a, a Gen Z uh, writer who was justifying quiet quitting. And she said, look, we will not be stressed. You just have to know we will not be stressed. And if you have an environment that's stressful, we will not participate. So, you know, it, you know, part of me is thinking, well, that's kind of bold and that's kind of their expectation. The other part of me feels disappointed because in my life, every, you know, personal growth comes from stress. When things don't go right mm. and you overcome it, you become a bit, you know, a better leader, a better person. So I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm sold on that defense of quiet quitting, but <laughs> I use that as an illustration to show their expectations are going to dramatically impact business, marketing, and culture. Absolutely. And I think this is also where um, the value of a community comes in. You can tap into different thoughts and ideas and see where people are coming from, from different generations. Just because we haven't grown up with that mindset doesn't mean that the next generation very much believes that. And as a business to stay relevant and also as a leader to attract the right talents and the best talents and keep them. We need to meet them where they are, not staying there, but, you know, picking them up, I would say, (laughs) to take them to the next stage. What I'm, you know, a little bit on the fence is these double standards, like the quiet quitting. I want to only work two or three days and ideally half days a week, but then still want to have the lifestyle, the affluent lifestyle that comes with working hard. Like there's a double standard, which I can't get my head around how to, come around but yeah uh, re- remote work six figure income <laughs> but two unlimited half days work. <laughs> yeah. and you know and, and you know part of it is look you know when i was 18 i wanted the same thing <laughs> <laughs> and then reality hit <laughs> yeah um now there are so many 
advantages obviously from building a community and when a business says you know i get it uh, we've got a fairly good following we don't necessarily have a community how do we make this transition from having followers maybe an audience to actually building a community what would be practical steps that we can take as a business or as a business leader well we've already talked a little bit about culture we've already talked a little bit about purpose is having that intersection and i think the next thing is really thinking about where your community might start. And here's something interesting I found. I you know, worked on this book for two years. I did a lot of research. I studied a lot of different communities and every community I studied, start the, the community started with people who were already there. Mm. So um, it could be people that you love to have lunch with. It could be people who are your best customers who believe in you and can't get enough of your brand. It could be your blog readers. It could be people who listen to your podcast. It could be your fans. And you say, look, I have this idea. I think I could accomplish more in this world if I had a community to do it with. Who would like to try this with me? And it might just be five people. It might be 10 people. That's how they start. I mean, there's a case study in the book uh, where Twitch, arguably the biggest community in the world, uh, was started by a bunch of game people, game players, gamers, I guess. I'm sounding old. These game players... <laughs> <laughs> They're playing on their video devices. Devices. <laughs> and they discovered this thing. Oh, yes, it was software. I believe they call it. Uh, <laughs> the game players. <laughs> We're showing our age here, don't we? <laughs> so embarrassed. You can edit that part out. <laughs> well, but what happened was they built this software to, to create this live streaming culture. Mm. They had no idea that gamers would love this. And, and the gamers pulled them into it. The gamers created Twitch, not the software developer, but the, you know, the community was already there. Mm. So you just have to kind of pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a big company, there could already be a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group, a Twitter chat devoted to your industry, devoted to your company, devoted to your products. You don't always need to start it from scratch. It could already be happening somewhere. So, you know, don't overlook that idea. But generally speaking, the, the people who believe in you are already there somewhere. And it's just a matter of fanning the flames, encouraging it giving them some some content, some things to think about. And now what's happening in my community is they're having so much fun <laughs> and they're learning so many things that they're telling people outside the community who are saying, wow, how do I become part of that? I haven't done really any promoting. Um, the only person I've recruited in, in the last month would be you. I want you to be in my community, Petra. <laughs> Uh, yes. and, and it, it, it it's it's open mm -hmm. it's free uh it, it, you know it's just a fun safe place any of the people uh listening to your show uh they can go to my website businessesgrow.com on the top it says community you go there tells you how to get in mm -hmm. and you can be in and i hope you do 100 um, i mean <laughs> but, but i i haven't um I, I, you know, I haven't had to ask anybody to be in because people are sharing the, the activities in the community. And isn't that the best marketing of all when you have organic advocacy? When Absolutely. people are saying, this is so cool, please come, come and do this thing with me. Mm. And, and, and so the, the community is growing on its own and I just hope it doesn't grow too fast because I love it. <laughs> You know, this is such a testimony to you that you are 
curating again the best communities and the best people and the best minds and i think this is you know your humble leadership style it's not about you it's about you bringing people together for a common purpose and you know also what you mentioned start where people are at already you don't have to waste hours and days and weeks to find a platform and so forth um is there a trend like what i've seen over the last few months and i've been part of a few communities on telegram and discord there are more micro communities like they're not thousands of people there's maybe 200 is that yeah. a trend that you're seeing you know I do, i'm not sure if it's a trend you know it's a great question i i think you know one of the communities in the book is is sephora which is a big cosmetic mm -hmm. and skincare company and they've got six million people in their community mm -hmm. and that suits them just fine mm -hmm. uh, i think 80% of their sales come from their community. Even though mm. they've got stores, the community is the business. They spend a billion dollars a year on their community. Now, that's the right size for them. There's another case study in the book. It's a fella that has 30 people in his community. Mm. You know, it's a they, they want to learn about real estate, real estate investing. He drove $40 million in revenue from 30 people. That's the right size. Mm. You know, I think it kind of gets back to your purpose. I mean, in my community, it's about learning. So I kind of like to have it small. Mm. If, if it was 10,000 people, I think I would die. You know, I just <laughs> it would be, it would be, you know, I, I like the personal interaction. So mm. I'm literally just taking it week by week to see what happens and how does this evolve? And, you know, leaders are emerging. It, it's been wonderful to see. I mean, again, this is a learning experience for me because I'm thinking, okay, you know, got this community. There's a job I have to do. If I don't do it, you know, it's not going to get done. And that's not it at all. That's not the way it works. And I'll never remember. I'll never forget how magical this was. Somebody had an idea. They wanted to change something in the community or start something in the community. And I said, well, that's a really good idea. Why don't you do it? She said, okay. And she did. Mm -hmm. And so every time this discussion has come up, I said, all right, go take it, see what happens. Mm. And, and so, uh, you, you know, chapter four in the book has this great case study from Dana Malstaff. And, uh, it's the first, this is my 10th book belonging to the brand. And I did something in chapter four. I haven't done any other time. I devoted a chapter to one entire person and that's Dana because she's such an inspiration, such a visionary. She mm -hmm. said, and, and she has a community with 70,000 people. She's nearly a million dollar business. It's been doubling every year. She has no salespeople, no marketing department and no marketing budget. And she has no staff. That's a, quite a business, isn't it? Incredible. It's and marketing. Think, it's marketing hmm. without marketing. Absolutely. At least what we traditionally think of as 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 marketing. Hmm. And um, you know, Dana said, my goal is not to create bureaucracy. It's not to create a staff. I don't want a paid staff. You know, my my job is to recognize and nurture leaders. Hmm. Absolutely. And you also have um in the book a chapter on the commercial side of things the business case of communities and you know dana is just one of those examples and sephora obviously they put so much money into the community because they also get it back and i'm actually curious you know thinking about the next stages there will probably be eventually a community leader training how do you even build a community because it's a different role we haven't necessarily had it it's usually a social media manager who does community yeah. on the side yes. <laughs> Or well, somebody and, 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 and yeah, this is um, it, it's emerging as a professional discipline. Mm. And um, there's actually been a, com a community created for community leaders and a conference for community leaders. They could they prefer to be called community professionals. And so it, it's great to see. And, and I think many of those people have already read my book because I mean, this is what they're all about. Right. And what's made me feel great 
is these people are doing this every day and they're reading my book and they said, oh, wow, I was thinking about this all wrong. This is, there, there are big ideas here. I'm really energized by what you have to say. So that, you know, that that's good because I was a little nervous, you know, stepping into the whole community thing because they're very experienced and very proud of what they do. But it looks like if you don't have a community or if you do, you can find some value from the book. Absolutely. And I think often when you are in the jar, you can't read the label. So you don't necessarily know what's right or wrong and everything is evolving. So getting different insights from a different community leader and say, oh, I'm doing it this way or we have introduced that ritual or whatever it might be. It's like, oh, this could actually work for us too. Again, it's a co-creation of knowledge and experience that makes it evolve and actually valuable, I would say. Yes, that's 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 exactly right. And you know, I think there's a lot of room for, for growth in this area. I mean, my book is not a how-to book. It does not tell you how to hire a community manager. It does not tell you what to do if somebody is causing trouble in your community. It's not that kind of book. This is a book about an entirely new view of community through the lens of brand marketing. Nobody's talked about it that way before. And that's the real value of the book. But then you know, a lot of people, you get into it, just do it. Just start. You, you know, n- nobody's an expert in this. Just like I said, nobody's an expert in anything. Mm. You know, I'm learning every single day. And sure, I'm reading books about community. I'm trying to learn from others. But, you know, the best way to learn is to really just go through the experiences. Absolutely. And getting inspiration for how it would work for your personality, for your size of business, for your industry. This is, I think, where the real value is because it's not a cookie cutter approach anymore and marketing should never be because then it's in genuine and people can sense that. <laughs> so it's 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 honestly, it's a fantastic inspiration and idea starter book um, and also very practical at the same time, <laughs> which, which I always love to see. Oh, this is how it works because of those case studies. Now, Mark, where can we find you? Where uh, We'll put all the links, obviously, in the show notes. Um, highly recommend to read the book. It's an easy read. Um, and yeah, what's next for you? Where do you want to take your community? And I'm, I'm excited to join, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and 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 really, any you know, I'd love to have you. You're, you're the perfect person to be in this community because you're curious and you're open-minded. So you, you'll be a perfect addition to the community. But I want to emphasize that, you know, anybody- Thank you listening if, if you're interested in just learning about what's going to be next in marketing this is a mm. it's an exciting place to be and it's open to everybody so you can find out about me and my books my community my blog my podcast is on businessesgrow.com i mean nobody can remember how to spell schaefer but i figure you can you know remember businesses grow and there's lots of fun resources there the blog is free the podcast is free my book costs a little bit of money, you know, 19 US dollars, but it's $19 for two years of my life. What a bargain. <laughs> it is a bargain. And I can attest, I got it on my Kindle, one of the first books that I got on my very new Kindle. And I honestly, I love it. I love it. It's such oh, an easy read. You. So well done. And congrats again to leading the way before everyone else jumps onto the bandwagon. So thank yeah. you so much for your work. Thank you so much for being so well prepared and uh, leading such a great conversation. My pleasure. Thank you so much.